Welcome everyone. Just gonna get about a, do about another minute here and I'll let the attendees in. Thanks for joining this morning. All right, it does seem that we've, um, our curve of attendee attendance has flattened out. So maybe we should get started. So I just, um, I wanna welcome everybody. My name is Jen Cassell and I am um, part of the LTR LNO office and together with um, my colleague, Kristen Weiss, and with huge help from Cora Johnston from the VCR and, and Brian Kim from Beaufort Lagoon LTR sites, we're really pleased to welcome an amazing panel of speakers for our um, career session this morning. So this is the second in the series of virtual career panels. Um, and uh, today we'll be um, exploring careers um, in data science and research coordination. And um, we're really pleased to have five excellent panelists. And so what I wanna do first is just do a little bit of um, Zoom business here and how we're gonna run this webinar. So first off, we are recording the webinar so that everybody knows. And we've found that the best way for you to ask questions is to use the Q&A function, which is down in the lower um, panel of your window. And using the Q&A function, you can write your question there. Um, and if you actually want to say your question verbally, um, we can unmute you and have you do that, but you still need to use the Q&A box just to say, hey, I'm, I have a question, you know, I'd like to ask it verbally. Um, and, or you can raise your hand and we can try to find you that way. But we do find that we can get through this more efficiently and more questions can be answered if, in fact, you just type them in the Q&A window. The um, fun thing is that in the Q&A window, you all can upvote questions. So if you um, see a question that you also want answered or you were gonna type the same question, just upvote it. And we'll try to get to those questions that have a lot of upvotes um, as a priority. Um, we'll do our best as well to direct your questions to um, the appropriate panelist or panelists. But if you have um, want to gear your question towards one or more of the panelists, you can do that by just typing your question and, and who, who you want to um, answer it. And if you want to identify yourself in your LTR site in the Q&A, you can do that as well. Or you can actually ask the question anonymously. So you don't have to have your name associated with the question. Now, after the webinar, we're going to be sending a very, very short um, a survey to you. And we hope that you have time. It's just two or three questions. And it really helps us plan these webinars and gets um, really valuable feedback for us. So we hope that you'll want to do that. And finally, um, in the past, we haven't been able to get to all of the questions in the Q&A. And so we'll be putting those into a Google Doc and having our panelists respond as well after the fact. So um, don't be too worried if, if not every question gets answered in detail. We'll try to circle back on that. So I'll stop now and I'll turn it over to Kristen, who's going to um, briefly introduce uh, the speakers. They're going to introduce themselves and then we're going to simply open it up to questions. You can continue to, you can type your Q&A um, questions even as our panelists are introducing themselves. That's okay, you can get started on that. You don't have to wait. So thanks, so Kristen. Thanks, Jen. So I'm Kristen Weiss. I'm the communications coordinator with the LTER network office and I'm based in Santa Barbara. And just really excited and honored to be here again for our second of three career panels. And we have five more awesome panelists. So I'm just gonna introduce their name and title and let them dive into their uh, careers and backgrounds so that you hear mostly from them. And don't hesitate to start writing Q and A's in the box because we wanna spend the majority of our time on your questions. So as Jen said, go ahead and start doing that as soon as you have them. So with no further ado, I'm just gonna go alphabetically to keep things fair. So we're gonna start with Stephen Diggs and he's at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the Hydrographic Data Group and I will let him explain what that means. All right, go ahead. Steven, you're, you have to unmute yourself. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
that got off to an auspicious start. Um, if I want to screen share, I suppose I should uh, get screen sharing from the host. Yes. Do you need to screen share, Stephen? I do, just briefly. Okay. And don't worry, other panelists, I'm making it so that it goes much more smoothly for you. Um, Stephen, I, I have made you a co-host. You should be able to screen share now. Let me know. Sounds great. Thank you. He's an overachiever. He's got slides for us. Yeah. Well, we'll see how well that goes, right? All right. Um, hi. Good morning, everyone. And as the first panelist uh, to go through, my name is Steve Diggs, and I'm a technical director at the Hydrographic Data Office at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And um, if you can't see my slides, make a crazy gesture that says I can't see it. So I was always a nerd. Uh, this is me in eighth grade making a water drip generator. Um, and there's an arc to this. Um, a few years ago, I had to give a resume and I thought I'd do something a little bit different. And since I may be a little older than the other panelists, I have a lot more history. And so that history looks like this, um, if you break it down. And you would think that this area here where I got my degree was sort of the pivotal moment that I became a professional, shaped everything that I was going to do. But in reality, it couldn't be further from the truth. It was just m more educational background. So as a nerd, as an engineer, um, and as much more of a mechanic than anything else, I've always wanted to be hands-on. And that became apparent to me early on. And so not only was my early days as a programmer at Scripps as an undergraduate, it shaped my career, but right after that I became an electrician for the Navy. And so um, I went through and always knowing that I wanted to be hands-on with the instruments, became an instructor through UCSD Extension. But the bottom part of my little resume here shows that I became a triathlon coach and that leadership experience actually informed my professional experience as much as anything else. And so my, uh, my little thing is to be true to yourself and have that career arc. And I think that if you stay aligned with who you really are, that's where you maximize and trying to be somebody else, um, no matter what it is, is going to lead to, um, I guess, less uh, stellar outcomes. So with that, I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Thanks, Steve. That's a beautiful message to start off our panel. All right, next on our list is Nikki Dix, and I hopefully can get the name of the reserve correctly. You can correct me. Guana Talamato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve. Oh, very good. <laughs> That's way better than most people do. So yeah, great job. Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I am a research coordinator and um, our reserve is called the Guana Tolomato Matanzas because of the three rivers that make it up and we're a national estuarine research reserve. So um, some people call us the NIR system, but I like to call us the NERS because it just um, makes us all nerds. So I really appreciate <laughs> Steven's intro there because we're all nerds here. Um, so I grew up in um, Orlando, Florida and um, kind of watched um, the area develop around me and so at an early age I had a save the environment club and um, just really had a passion for um, you know our natural resources and um, kind of figured that I wanted to um, I really wanted to change people's minds about how they treated our environment so when I went to college I got a um, double majored in biology and science education um, I did my internship for education. I taught anatomy physiology at high school. Um, after that internship, they offered me a job like right away because they really need teachers, you know. But I wanted to try out the research angle first. Um, so I ended up um, at a consulting firm doing an internship and um, quickly realized that if you want to go um, much further in that field that you need a, a master's degree or, or higher. So. Um, when people ask me what I wanted to do with a biology degree, I would always say, I don't know, I love it all, but anything but algae, I really don't like algae. Um, so, of course, for my master's, I ended up in a psychology lab studying algae. <laughs> so, 
so never say never. Um, and anyway, in that position, um, we were contracted by the, the Guanatola Mata Matanzas NER to um, do their monthly nutrient sampling. Um, and I did the chemical analyses in the lab and um, studied plankton ecology and oysters and things like that. So um, my dream job in grad school, um, I knew I wanted to be a research coordinator because I had this experience. I was a graduate research fellow for the NER system. And I just really fell in love with like the, um, the national aspect, the coordination, the standardized protocols, and you know, the family feel of it all. Um, so um, after grad school, I had my first interview. The research coordinator had just retired at the GTM NER, um, and I really bombed the interview, so I didn't get it. <laughs> Um, I went on to get a, post, a postdoc, which was amazing because I learned a lot more about plankton. Um, and then the research coordinator that had gotten that position um, before ended up leaving. Um, so I was, I was like second in line and I was ready to go right when that happened. So it all worked out in the end and I ended up with my dream job. Um, and so uh, day to day is a lot of what it sounds like, coordination, um, working with um, university faculty that are coming to the area to do research, working with my own um, research staff leading long-term monitoring programs, um, working within our state agency, um, looking at statewide um, management issues, monitoring protocols, things like that. Um, so it's a lot of emails and meetings, <laughs> not really what I had expected. Um, but I do get to go out in the field a lot when people need help and whatnot. So um, I love it because I'm always learning new things um, and that's what got me into this in the beginning. So I think that will sum it up. Awesome, thank you so much, Nikki. Well, that never say never. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, our next panelist is Jennifer G and she is from the James San Jacinto Mountains Reserve. need to unmute myself there. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, the dog's going to now get excited because I'm talking. So that's my dog, Dexter, back there. You can just ignore him and pay attention to me. But my story is probably going to be shorter than everyone else's. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on where I am now and what I do because it's very strange. I'm the director of a biological research station and actually two of them. And one of them has like huge facilities and we get big classrooms of students. But where I started out was a student of English literature and a minor in classics at Swarthmore College. And then I went back, I had a free ride at the University of Washington and thought I just missed the mountains so much and the ocean, I'm from Washington State. So I actually ended up going back and started, started another major in fisheries. But then I switched over started working for a lab in his, uh, in a lab run by John Wingfield, who was doing research in Alaska. So I spent a couple of summers driving from Seattle to north of the Brooks Range to Tulick Lake Biological Research Station. So I just knew that that would be my career. I applied to graduate school, got my PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. I study speciation. I'm interested in hybridization. I started a new system that was in California um, on hybridizing quail, California and Gamble's quail. And I was the student of Peter and Rosemary Grant who study Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. So that was my research trajectory. And I thought I was gonna be an academic. So I spent two more years um, getting a postdoc and then three following years getting another postdoc and decided that I really didn't wanna be an R1 researcher. So then I got an assistant professorship at Whitman College. It's a very small teaching college, sort of like Swarthmore, where I started out. So I had come full circle. I was mentoring students, doing independent projects on the weekends, and decided I just missed research so much. So after that year, I ended up driving. Well, I didn't have a car for five years, so I bought a pickup truck, and I drove it down to Deep Canyon, where I had done my dissertation research, and I took a sabbatical year, which meant that I was kind of unemployed. But I was working very hard in the field and working part time for the Claremont Colleges at the Bernard Field Station as their temporary field station director. And then I, I 
Boyd Deep Canyon, where I did my dissertation research, is part of the University of California Natural Reserve System. And there's 41 of the reserves that are managed by University of California. And we manage over 750,000 acres in California in like every life zone possible. I never would have thought that I'd end up in the mountains again. I had given away all of my winter west. But here I am at an elevation of about a mile high and the director of a research station where I have like a min wear many, many hats. Unlike um, everyone else, I have a very broad job, I think, where I'm sometimes writing, like I, right now I just, before this, I wrote a list of what my major projects are right now. So I am, I got a National Science Foundation grant to, for a leadership training course for women who are in um, remote institutions like this one. And so we're always, I'm always planning for that and trying to put together a leadership training program. And we have a, a partner project that is a book. So if any of you want to contribute a chapter to Women of the Wild, um, we're looking for, for writers and authors. And I'm always doing weird stuff, like we need to get a trailer so that we can do fire abatement. Um, somebody called me who has like a girl, a really huge program in Los Angeles that's sort of like scouts, and she wants to start a project here. We're writing safety protocols for COVID-19 so that people can continue to do research here and can continue to bring classes here. And we're doing virtual tours, so I'm trying to figure out how to shop our research facility to people virtually now. I mean, it's just one weird thing after another and drawing up budgets and trying to figure out how to raise money, talking to donors, you know, corresponding with people. I've been calling a lot of people that are over the age of 90 these days just to sort of check on them because it's part of my job. So it's, it's soup to nuts here. Wow. Thanks, Jennifer. That's definitely like, I don't know how you could ever fit that job description into. You know, I know, and I actually skipped over. I'm looking down at my list and I'm like, oh yeah, and I'm also publishing papers and I've also got students and oh yeah. Keeps growing. That's amazing. I love your background as well, where you're at. And I'm glad that you have internet access today. Yes. Your remote location. So thank you. All right. We're going to hop to our next panelist. We have Beth Nelson, and she is with the USDA Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, so as Kristen said, so I direct the North Central Region's uh, Sustainable Ag Research and Education uh, Program, and it is a USDA federal uh, program. We get our funding from the National Institute for Food and Agriculture in a a yearly amount and then we our charge is to give out funding to advance uh, agricultural practices that are good for people profit and planet um, to, through various means and we are a little different from some USDA programs in that we're de we are decentralized so when I said we're the north central region that's the upper 12 midwest states and each of the, there are four different regions in the US and each of us has a fair amount of autonomy to develop the programming and the grant programs that we want. We do mostly uh, the work that we do through grants. So we have uh, in the North Central region, we have six grant programs um, that we run each year. And we have a pretty small staff. Another thing that's a little bit unusual about SARE is our governance is by an administrative council. So we're a little over 30 years old now. And when we were established, um, the governance of our group deciding who gets funded and what programs we're gonna have is a panel, ours is 20 people. Uh, about four or five of them are farmers and ranchers. And then we also have stakeholders um, personnel from from federal government, from state governments, uh, pe personnel from nonprofit organizations working in sustainable ag, uh, researchers and extension. So it's a pretty diverse group making these decisions about what we should do and what we should fund. So as you can imagine, a lot of my responsibilities are facilitation. And uh, I really do love my job. I got into science because I love science. I really like biology. 
love observing how the natural world works, uh, was raised in a family with a strong sense of social justice. And so uh, in, in the late 70s, when I was in high school, I did a project about world hunger. Uh, it was the point where we were kind of talking about, again, how we would feed the world. And um, I, in, as part of a report, I read a book that talked about having to do triage, that we would just have to rip off some of these nations that were not going to make it. And I was appalled. We had a, a youth garden at church where we raised produce and took it down to the food pantry. And one of the agronomists there who did a soil test for us said, Beth, if you like growing plants and you want to feed the world, you should go into agronomy. And I didn't know what agronomy was, so I grew up in St. Louis, not on a farm, but went into agriculture and it was terrific. So those pivotal moments are sometimes, you don't see them when they're happening, um, but you just kind of have to pay attention. I think there's a, if I had to give a one-liner to remember, and I'll do this poorly, I can't remember. It's one of the coffee companies said something about life is a uh, great stay awake for it or something like that. And I think just paying attention to those things that happen can be really important. Um, I do have a pretty circuitous path. So I went on to, I didn't plan to go on to grad school. I went to Purdue in international agronomy um, and then decided to go on for my master's and my PhD and wound up doing pretty basic lab research. Um, and then, you know, life changes uh, happened at various points and I wound up moving back into more communications, which was another one of my interests, putting together extension type publications in sustainable agriculture. And what I loved about that was the emphasis on that bottoms up structure, that the experts are the practitioners who are doing the work and we need to listen to them and be able to take their information in as well as give them information back. So how important that loop was. Um, and so that is a lot of the work that I do now too in coordinating the research for this grant program. Um, I think uh, Nikki mentioned a lot of emails and I would say yes, that's my day is an awful lot of communication via email or on phone. And it can be with uh, stakeholders, with our administrative council, with staff, a lot with applicants who want to apply for programs. We're trying to, you know, make sure they have all the information to write a good uh, proposal. The, the competitive proposal funding thing is so frustrating for people and we just want to try to make that as painless as it can be. Um, and then trying to get good thorough reviews, finding reviewers and, and doing all that. So a lot of relational work as well as just kind of project management and figuring how to make processes run smoothly. So I think both that ability to, um, to observe and to know how to connect people and connect ideas, um, as well as some of that attention to detail are things that have really served me well in the position that I have. And what I really love to do is to be able to go out and visit projects some. I don't get to do that a lot. I am 100% administration. Um, but I get to travel a few days every month to conferences or something. And we spend two weeks in the summer traveling in a state, visiting all the various projects that we have funded. And a number of those go directly, those projects are directly to farmers and ranchers to try ideas on their farmer ranch. So uh, that's, that's a great part. So I'll just close by saying, I, I love my job. There's, there's grunt and detail work involved. Um, but it's really been a great gig for me. And I, I uh, feel like doors just opened on my career path. And I'm very lucky. Thanks so much, Beth. I think none of us can get away from being overloaded with emails, but it's, it's great to hear, you know, that you love your job and just to hear how all these varied skill sets can be useful in a really applied setting. So thanks for that. And we've got tons of questions rolling in. So we have our final panelist to introduce. We have Paul Schuler, and he is with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute at the Center for Biostatistics and Modeling. Thanks. Yep. So I, I work 
uh, in the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's research branch, the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. And, and our group kind of serves as internal consultants to provide biologists and managers support on almost anything quantitative. We have database managers that can assist them. And then we also have statisticians that can help with data analysis or study design or just graphical uh, support. Um, but I'd like to get a little bit of background of kind of how I got here, I guess. Um, so I grew up in Wisconsin and I spent a lot of time fishing on freshwater lakes and that ultimately shaped my career, even though I would say that at the beginning, I didn't really know where I was going. I kind of went to college because that's what you're supposed to do, right? But I didn't, it took me a couple years to think about what I wanted to do, but I kind of just said, hey, you know, I like lakes a lot. They're really interesting ecosystems to me. I'm going to study them. So I went and I got a degree in fisheries. Um, and later on in my undergraduate, my advisor said, hey, have you ever thought about grad school? You know, you're a good student. And I hadn't, but I did then and I went to graduate school and I I went to University of Georgia and I studied um, population dynamics of Atlantic sturgeon using market recapture modeling and basically, you know, kind of looking at what abiotic and biotic factors influenced uh, population dynamics of sturgeon. Um, I, I think I really benefited from there being some really quantitatively talented faculty members there at the time, which gave me a really good quantitative background, which became very important for me in the future. But again, after I got my master's, I, you know, I didn't, I just went to start getting a PhD because that just seemed like what I was supposed to be doing at the time. Um, so I went uh, to start a degree up at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And there I joined a lab that had kind of a long term market recapture data set on brook trout. My project specifically was, was going to be looking not, it wasn't going to be focused on that study site, but we were going to be looking at how stream connectivity affected population persistence so that maybe we could re re remedy some stream connectivity but we wanted to do it in a biologically realistic way, not just reconnect maximum miles of stream networks. Um, and I'd say a few years into my dissertation work, I kind of started to realize that maybe academia wasn't for me. Um, I'm not saying academic research can't be applied well to resource management, but from my Perspective other than just ecological, I guess you could say. Uh, and then, then some wrenches kind of came into my dissertation. I um, I was doing some telemetry as well as genetic studies to kind of determine what scale we should consider populations to be distinct, and therefore uh, what level of movement is best reconnected from stream restorations. And um, well, a hurricane wiped out my telemetry study site um, pretty massively, and you wouldn't think that happens in, in southern Vermont, but it was. It was Hurricane Irma. Hey, Paul. We're having a little bit of audio trouble with you, Paul. Can can you hear um, me? Um, you're freezing up just a little bit. I wonder if maybe turning off your video for a minute or two could help. And if you looked at a, at a map, it was almost comical. It was a 300 meter stretch of the river that was the most can. Okay. So I was afraid that would happen. It looks like we lost Paul. Um, and so um, I think we, we hope he will join back in again. There he is. Um, Paul, we lost you for a minute and a f about a minute maybe of what you were saying was frozen up um, pretty well. So I see you moving maybe to a better internet situation. And, and you're muted right now as well. Sorry about that. Um, where That's did I get? Okay. We, only, we only lost about a minute, probably, of of your of what you said there. What did I say last? Uh, Talking about um, the hurricane um, arriving. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a hurricane wiped out my telemetry study site really bad, and I gave some examples of how bad it was, but we'll skip that. Uh, and then, and then shortly after that, we found out we had a bad reagent that we were using in our genetics lab. So a lot of my genetics data needed to be redone. And so this was kind of all happening at the same time as me really kind of realizing that academia might not be the career path I wanted. But, you know, working in this lab gave me a lot of good quantitative background. Um, and, you know, at, later on while I was there, I also ran out of funding and I was no longer getting an assistantship. 
And my advisor quite literally told me he wasn't going to try and find any more funding for me. But I was fortunate to find a job posting for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that um, I, the job posting described the skill set I had. And it was a very, it was this consulting based work in an agency that was going to be very applied to management, which had appealed to me greatly. So I applied for that position and I took it and, um, and you know, it was, it kind of, I kind of got that job around the time that two of my major dissertation chapters sort of fell apart. So I, you know, I could have finished my dissertation while I was down at Florida, but I was starting a new job. I, you know, I had a new house, a new child, and it, it just wasn't a great situation to do a dissertation in the evening. But I had stumbled upon a job that I absolutely loved. And I, I um, you know, I feel fortunate that not completing my dissertation didn't hold me back. Um, and, and it's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, always exciting in Zoom. And also, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's nice to know that sometimes life happens, right? And your best laid plans sometimes get shifted, but that doesn't mean that everything is a disaster and, you know, just looking for new opportunities. So I think with that, we're going to dive into questions and Jen and I are going to kind of help facilitate that. Um, but I think one of the first questions that a lot of folks have is they'd love to know a little bit more about just what the day-to-day -day work is like for you guys. And I think we've heard some of that, especially from our research coordinators, but um, particularly for Steven, and then maybe even a little bit more, Paul, from you about, you know, what does it mean to be a data scientist and what do you do day-to-day? -day? And then also if anyone else would like to chime in on other things that they didn't get to mention. Well, I find myself at home recently a lot, so the commute's good. Um, <laughs> my, uh, one of the things I heard from all the other panelists was the love of their job. And the other thing I heard from them that it, if you want to know what they do, it takes about a five minute good conversation. You can't sum it up in a paragraph, but the love of what you do turn, has some unexpected uh, positive consequences. I end up all over the world in February. I was I served on a NSF review panel um, and I got stuck in Antarctica um, in the dry valleys and so that that was that was one day on the job uh, the two weeks before that I was in Geneva um, at the WMO um, talking about long-term ocean observations and the reason that I end up in all these weird places unlike a lot of my colleagues who who've gone into academia and that's kind of my family background my, both my siblings are professors is that I'm sort of an inside the machine practical experience person. And, um, and so when I comment on things, it's how the gears mesh together. Um, half that time is because my fingers got caught in the gears. So I have a really good feeling for how things can go sideways. And there's not a lot of people willing to share um, problems and failures and potential uh, impediments. And so that's part of any evaluation. And so as a, as a, day-to-day -day technical director of my center is I've, I know all of the instruments I've been to see with all of them, deployed all of them, so I know the failure modes. And that makes it, as part of a team, I bring an important voice, um, but there are many others. Part of my team is 10 people, um, three of whom are tenured professors at Scripps Oceanography. And so it's a well-rounded team. And so my day-to-day -day environment is very different, but very few days are spent just in front of a computer all day, every day. So I guess I'll, I'll go there. Um, my computer, my days are spent in front of a computer all day, every day. <laughs> um, so as I said, I serve as an internal consulting service, basically. So I pretty much code in R all day, every day. Um, but more specifically, I, I have a great diversity of projects because you know the state of Florida has pretty great diversity of resources. So we have a lot of people researching those diverse resources. So, and we serve in all capacities of support. You know, we, we might be along the way for all the data analysis of a project, or we might just field a very small specific question for a, a biologist who who knows what they're doing, but just kind of got tripped up on something. So, um, so if I think about a typical day, really what I probably do most days is I'm spending 
60 to 70% of my time on a large project that's going to take me weeks to a month. And then I field a few small questions or put a little bit of time on something that's only going to take me a couple hours so that I can get that biologist an answer quicker. And, and we also do a few things like teach workshops within the agency to, to help um, keep biologists' skills a little, a little higher so that we don't have to help on every single one. Great, thanks um, all. There's a question um, from Lauren that Nikki answered already over in the answered, but I'd like to pose it to, um, it's very general and I'd like to pose it to several of you. And Lauren's question is, are there any skills that are typically undervalued or overlooked in graduate education that you've found va to be valuable in your career? And Nikki noted that, yeah, for estuarine research, driving a boat's important and learning to read research papers quickly, digesting, those are good skills to learn in grad school. Can our panelists think of other things that might be currently overlooked um, for these, these graduate students now that might you know, be really useful? Like if you had known then what you know now. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say something about that from a data science perspective. And it's something I meant to do in my introduction, but obviously that got a little chopped up there. So we kind of have a customer service aspect to what we do in our group. So the people skills are very important. And actually when we're hiring somebody for our group, we obviously care a lot about their modeling abilities and their technical skills, but really we're looking a lot at, your, at their people skills because they need to be able to relate to biologists to uh, help them keep their project moving forward. Um, and, and it's really important to be able to convey very complicated things that they might not understand as well as you do in a simple manner that um, is engaging for them. And, that, and you want them to sort of enjoy their customer experience, so to speak, so that they um, pass on word about our group being useful and have other people and tell other people how helpful we can be to them. Maybe Beth or Jennifer has. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Um, I would say that one of the best things that I did as a graduate student was trying to find mentors um, outside of my university and in other areas at field stations and just reaching out and being somewhat aggressive and pushy about just sort of somebody else asked a question about this. And it's sort of like if, if you don't know anything and you're thinking about becoming like a field station director, then email someone, do a little bit of homework about their research station and ask if they have time to meet with you and just talk to them. Like, um, I can't remember who, I think it was Stephen who said it takes like more than five minutes to kind of figure out where what someone does and what it looks like from day to day. And it, it, for many of us, I mean, it looks very, very different from week to week and month to month. So, you know, the project that I'm working on right now is a proposal to the state for matching funds, Prop 68. And, but that was not even present until it passed a couple years ago. So it wasn't something I spent my time doing. So it, it really is just something that I think you need to reach out to uh, several people and just sort of ask them what they do and what their day to day life looks like. And, and I'll jump in too. So I, I would say that one thing that just recently has struck me is uh, so um, as Paul was saying, those people skills are really important, those social skills. And even socializing as a graduate student, I think is really important. And I will tell you one of the latest um, things that I did came about because of my fellow graduate students, which is 40 years ago, um, you know, recommending me for something. So those relations that you have and how people get to know you as you're doing graduate work um, will really um, be useful if they're great anyway you need that social interaction but it's useful down the line as well and the other thing I would say that I was pretty timid about doing as a graduate student was thinking about what's important to you and what you really need and not being afraid to express that to those mentors that uh, Jennifer just mentioned so um, I know I really struggled with how to, I loved children, knew I came, grew up in a big family, wanted to have children, uh, knew I wanted that to be a part of my life and knew that 
going into a science career, especially academics, was very demanding. Um, and so had concerns about that and concerns that there wasn't availability for part-time work. And I had a chance to express that um, and really debated about whether to say anything in, in a talk that I gave once and uh, was amazed at the positive response I got from what I considered very traditional uh, men in the field who'd been around a while who were sympathetic, had their own, you know, daughters going through similar things. So I, I would say giving some time to think about that and, and finding a trusted mentor to talk about and not being afraid to do that was really important for me. That's great. Didn't any of our other panelists have uh, a comment on that? Okay. Go on to a next question from um, this is an anonymous question that has a lot of upvotes, and I think it does capture um, some of the worries of a lot of early career scientists. So, this is um, someone who's worried about whether to do a master's or PhD, went the PhD route, and really enjoys the research. But um, for those of you who have experienced this, uh, if you decide after you finish your PhD that you want to go into a non-academic or you know non-traditional academic role, how do you sell the PhD? Um, how you know how is it useful? And are, do you have tips for how do you you know sell those skills that you gain from the PhD for a non-academic position? Uh. I guess I'll say, I don't know that you have to. I mean, I'd say, you know, I work at a state agency and I wouldn't be surprised if more than half the people I work with have PhDs. Um, uh, so as long as your experience is applicable to the position, it's probably a benefit, not something that you need to sell. And I mean, within my group, 75% uh, of us have PhDs, excluding myself and one other person. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's something that needs to be sold, um, but that's that's from my perspective at the agency I work at. I was going to say the same thing. I think most research coordinators in the nurse system have PhDs, um, so it's not a bad thing at all. Um, I do. I I totally get where that person's coming from, though, because the more it seems like the the more degrees you have, the more pigeonhole you make yourself sometimes. Um, but I think thinking of it in terms of the skills that you've developed and the experience um, that you've gained, not just the degree, you know, I think those are the things to focus on. Great. There's a whole um, set of questions geared particularly towards data and data science, um, but I don't think necessarily they're geared just to Stephen or Paul since everyone on the panel has to work with data. So let me see if I can summarize a couple of these, but um, one is particularly for those of you that work with data, how do you keep current with recent advances in your field? And I'm just gonna tack on sort of the next question, which is, what do you, and some of you have touched on this already with programming and talking about R, but what do you think are the most important skills at your job um, towards data especially? Have you considered working at quantitative positions outside academic or conservation research? So I think we have a lot of students who are, you know, really interested in sort of um, exploring potential data paths. Um, but I think it would also be interesting to hear from, you know, all, any of you, uh, you're, you're all working with data in one form or another. So that's a lot of questions, but um, yeah. How do you keep recent and uh, current with the current advances and have it, you considered quantitative jobs outside of, of research? And the, these are typed in the Q&A too, so you can see them. Uh, I'll put you on the spot, Stephen. Okay. Thanks. Oh, sure. You're putting um, yourself on the yeah. spot. <laughs> Yeah, I'll put myself on the spot so I'll make it easier for everybody else to come along and look great. Um, so for those of you out here there that are looking w w the possibility of doing something not in environmental science or conservation, uh, I'm going to talk to your future self. And your future self will regret not following your path and making a, um, a practical decision that doesn't follow with who you are. And I can't emphasize that enough. If you stray from that, um, just like Beth was saying, she knew her priorities early on and, and having the courage to not, not speak out and be an activist, but just to say, you know, um, thank you or, or no, thank you. I think I'm going to 
go down this path is pretty important. Now to talk to your present self, um, I think one of the most important attributes or skills that you can develop, and especially now that we live in the age of pandemics, is agility, the ability to quickly adapt to things. I mean, in, you know, any student of biology can tell you that things that don't adapt don't survive. And so having an open mind uh, when it comes to things like data analysis, data science, and keeping current, the way I do it as a senior person is I hire young, smart people who have more available time and don't have a family yet and can just bury themselves in, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of notebooks online and we're doing Docker technology. And so you have to, at some point, trade the, to the bare metal expertise for a bigger picture view and know that your time, I was a teacher of Python and Perl, Linux internals and all that, and my skills are not as sharp as they used to be. But I have, over time with being so close to the data and backing away from it, I have a very good, or a much better in comparison with my young self, a better view of how it fits together. And so with my staff, I'm able to coordinate the people who are closer to the data, but I do, um, still advocate, and this is, you know, just to keep your brain sharp and to know, to be, speak with authority, is you should dive back in and uh, get your hands dirty as much as you can so that you re retain street cred. Now, Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Did you ever look or think about quantitative careers outside of research? So let's say broadly agency, academic, or conservation, but maybe even going industry? No, I can't say that I have because, you know, as I mentioned, uh, um, a lot of what got me where I was was the interest in very applied um, resource management. So um, it, it hasn't really crossed my mind to sort of leave a state agency or a type of position that I'm in. Um, of course, that's not true of everybody. I'm the program leader now because my predecessor left for the private industry uh, and that is to some extent money driven. Uh, her, her spouse also worked at the company, so there's that as well. But for me personally, I, I really enjoy the, the diversity of projects I get to work on and knowing that they're being used for direct management of Florida's natural resources. Uh, and I guess while I'm talking, I'll, I'll talk about kind of keeping up on skills. Um, it's sort of our job in the group to keep our skills um, modern because we're supposed to be able to provide you know the most cutting edge quantitative tools to support the research that's being done in the agency so we um we often go to workshops uh you know to to learn new things or you know really you just we end up working with such diverse data types that we kind of have to learn new stuff anyway you know I, like like i said my background was in market capture which makes me good at generalized linear models as well. And I did a lot of Bayesian estimation. You know, those skills can get me pretty far, but they, you know, you, you spend a, six months to a year in a position like in our group and you, you see a lot of different data types and you just kind of have to learn on the fly. But um, it's always encouraged to, to just spend some time reading materials and learning new skills because that's part of what the service we provide to the patients get. Thanks, Paul. Um, Beth, there's a question directed um, towards you, and it's from Leota Weinbaum, who, wants, who says, I'm interested in infectious disease in animal agriculture, but my time on farms before college was only with crops, and I'm having a hard time connecting with the industry and feel there is some understandable resistance towards, quote, ivory tower outsiders. And I think this question does go beyond just at the the context of agriculture and so forth and I think many of you could probably um, answer this how do you recommend someone in my position try to connect with the producers so you know I view this as a little bit broader for anyone who's going outside and connecting with the community Jennifer you're in a remote location connecting with your community but sometimes we're coming from what looks like an ivory tower do you have any comments on that Beth so I, I will, and I, I will say I'm not perfect about this. And, and one of the things I am a little uneasy about even now is not having grown up on a farm. So I did my grandparents farm, so I did get to bale hay in the summer. So that's my limited farm experience. Um, so I don't have that connection part of it. Um, 
And I will also confess that when I first started working in sustainable agriculture um, with a different group, um, I had two business cards, one that says PhD and one that doesn't. Um, and, and I don't often use PhD on my signature. Um, I feel like, the, you know, it's not that I'm, and it's exactly for that reason, to say that I'm not setting myself, you know, apart um, from your knowledge base with this information. Um, but I think uh, beyond that, I think just your willingness to listen, again, that's an important skill. And I think to ask them questions and to respond to those, um, recognizing that they're the expert and why do you do that? And to, you know, we are trained to, to evaluate a situation and give advice right away and to try to hold back from that a little bit. Um, you know, bring in some of that, maybe you want to think about doing this, but to just try to uh, frame your conversation so that you are doing a lot of listening uh, to what they're doing and why they thought of something and um, just kind of connecting that way is I think the the best way that you can do it. But But that is a reality that if you come in and say, you know, I'm the expert, uh, this is what you should be doing, it, it, it wouldn't fly well with any of us. Thanks, Beth. Kristen, do you wanna? Sure, yes. Yeah, so we have um, another question. Um, let me just get back to my list of questions here. So for, especially for our research coordinators, but I think you know, this also applies particularly to Stephen, who's now director, but science coordinator type of job seems like it's a, a job you would have further along in your career path. So what are some of the good stepping stone positions or jobs that one could look for, you know, when they're just starting out their career if they want to work that way? So maybe Nikki, if you want to start with that. Sure. So, um, I think field technicians type of job, of course. Um, also, um, honing your, you know, communication skills somehow is really important. So, um, not only being able to talk one on one with people um, and listen, but also, you know, your presentation skills, your writing, um, creative writing and technical writing. Um, if you can find positions that allow you the opportunity to kind of build all of, all of your skill set, not just the technical skills, but your interpersonal communication skills. I think that's important. Thanks, Jennifer or Beth, do you have anything to add? I agree with Nikki. I think she um, kind of nailed it when she said, just get kind of get in there and start swimming, doing something like being a field tech. And I think for me, I, I just write so much. So I write facilities management plans and strategic plans, but I'm also writing manuscripts and analyzing data and doing all kinds of like low to high level writing and communicating. And I think a lot of it, um, like some of these questions, people are saying, um, should I not tell people that I have a PhD and things like that? And it's sort of like, well, no, you should show people that you're really smart and that you know how to get things done, that you know how to ask the right questions and find the right people who can help you actually kind of like hone your skill sets. So, I mean, just kind of being around the environment that you want to work in, I think is really important. Thanks, Jennifer. And I'll just add that I also, several of you mentioned that you had done several postdocs and I found they were in very diverse fields and I thought that was very useful to be uh, coordinating broad research, you have a feel for different things. You have a, you kind of get a system for how you gain new knowledge and try to get up to date on a specific topic, which can be really important um, because you may be coordinating research in an area that you're less familiar with. And yes, the communication is a really critical thing. So I was lucky enough that my, one of my interim jobs was to work um, doing basically extension publications 
where we uh, did case studies, again, of very practical information. So we did it on a topic and we interviewed farmers and ranchers who were using that practice. And so it was really good for being able to both identify the kind of projects that needed to be done, get a, a wide uh, view of what's happening in that area, and then distill it into you know, something that easily could be conveyed to others. So I felt like that really broadened my background and set me up well for coordinating research. Great. And that sort of leads into the next question I'm looking at here in the Q&A um, from Eric Yi. And Eric, um, I think he highlights a fear that, uh, uh, that I fear many of our attendees on, on this panel or on this um, webinar um, share right now. And, and he says, you know, an underlying fear is I think we all have is never getting a preferred job. And while other fields like for profit, computer, science, biotech, pharma, job searches seem like more of a question of when. It sounds like folks here have stumbled, folks here meaning you panelists, have stumbled onto or just so happened to have found the right job. And we're also reading a ton of articles talking about the PhD glut and a large number of PhDs who are leaving their fields. Can the panelists comment a bit on this? For example, how have you coped with the in-between phases? And I'll say that that was a, a question from our last panel as well, and probably one that's going to come up on every um, career panel we have, which is, what do you do along the way to that, you know, or is this really a matter of stumbling into the right job? This is a tough question to ask. I know it's broad ranging, so I'm not, so I'm not going to, you know, great. Stephen, I see a hand. Yeah. Well, I, I think for all the panelists, and they may or may not agree with me, the illusion is, is that we stumbled into a job. The reality is, is that we made our reality as we went. And so a combination of preparation and seeing certain opportunities, for instance, my job didn't exist before I had it. And year to year, it changed and diverged from the original job description until it was, and I, and I hate to say this, but the, the true magic of it is it becomes much more what you wanted it to be here anyway. So you may take a particular job that um, has a very narrow definition and it may have some very particular things uh, in terms of your academic and your career preparation before you are quote unquote qualified for that job. And so something Jennifer said really resonated with me, which was get in there and start swimming and you'll start to see things. That experience is your preparation. And so there may be dead ends. Um, I can tell you as a person who's been alive for a few decades that it's never the end of the world. So don't be afraid to fail. And those failures can be very informative to getting to that true job. And then one day you'll be on a panel and somebody will say exactly what Eric said to you and say, how did you stumble into this job? Well, there was a lot of stumbling, but there was all, every failure was an opportunity to learn and refine and to go back. Um, so, you know, there's no time for each of us to go in and say all of the intricate things and inflection points that we have, but rest assured they're there. Um, and I think from what I've heard from the other panelists is there was a lot less stumbling um, and a lot more preparation and sort of in a decision tree way, minor adjustments toward where they are now. I'm going to add to that by saying that I stepped off the academic track when I went back to the University of Washington to get a degree in zoology. I just hated the sizes of the classes. I was taking like beginning chemistry and you know it was hard to find a seat at 8 a.m. and I just thought that's it. I'm going to quit this. I want to be a children's writer for television. So I started working for Mr. Rogers Neighborhood and I did it for just like a month and a half and was like boy this is not for me. I, I love ecology, I'm going back. So it's not like you are, are going to go to one like dead end and then just stop. There are like, it looked so linear. Stephen's timeline looked so nice and linear and like, you know, but his, I'm sure his path is like all of ours where it's just like very circuitous and we're just like following our noses. And in the end, I mean, you just really have to follow your heart. Once somebody, a postdoc once told me that and I ended up moving from California to New York and I followed my heart and I, I haven't turned back since. But that doesn't mean that you're following the same thing all of the time. You're just tracking your own interests as they come along. And I still look at job ads 
just to sort of see what's out there. And I still kind of, I, I worry about my CV and I'm thinking about it all the time and I want to make it look as kind of flexible as it, as I am. And I think Stephen also said, you know, especially during these times, uh, it's just really important to stay agile and be ready to kind of like move and take different opportunities as they arise. Thanks, Jennifer. I think that's a really important message. It's great to hear that. Um, kind of following on that, you know, we're hearing that you all are really grateful and love your jobs. Um, but there's a few questions from the audience about work life balance. So Brett Fredrickson asks, uh, he says, academia tends to have a reputation of poor work life balance, especially at the top levels. But what does work life balance look like in each of your careers? And another question related to that is, you know, is your career conducive to having family? What does that look like? So, you know, if, if there's a few of you that have had either challenges or insights um, about, you know, what does it mean to have balance or not in your career versus a traditional academic path? I can start. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one reason I love my job. Um, I work about 40 to 50 hours a week, I would say. Um, these days, because I'm working at home with my daughter here, it's definitely 40. <laughs> Not much more than that. Um, and that's, you know, um, and I, I want that, you know, I'm so passionate and I love what I do so much. But I, I feel that way about my family, too, um, and other things that we do outside of work. So I feel like that's really important. Um, now, when my daughter grows up and goes to college, I'll, I probably wor will work more and probably write more papers and things like that, because um, I, I do want to do that stuff, but um, not, not for now. curious if, if most of you could take on this question because some of you sit, you, you, you know, Stephen and Jennifer, you sit in academia, sort of, right? I mean, you're at university institutions, um, yet in these other roles. Paul, you're, and Beth, you're, you don't sit in an academic institution. So I, I'm kind of curious too, and not to put you all on the spot, but I'm going to put you all on the spot. Um, I think students really so are concerned with work-life balance. Uh... My yeah. situation is a little bit different. I um I have a daughter who's 12 who's sitting right next door to me in seventh grade in her bedroom, and uh, so all the social stuff is ramping up. And I and I as I said before, I travel internationally quite a bit. I was only home three out of four weeks in any given month. Um, so being at home and and reconnecting with all of my colleagues um, via Zoom has actually given me a window into her life. And I'm going to take a little bit different tack to this though. Um, what I hear a lot of, especially with early career people, is they think that these things are monoliths, the institution, work-life balance. When you embark on your career, you're shaping this thing, okay? So it's not a predefined anything. Nikki is talking about being home with her daughter and having to adjust her hours. I, I Beth talked earlier about having um, kids. Paul is um, not in academia, but very much an academic and a data scientist, and Jennifer is God knows where. Um, with a dog walking around behind her. They're all very different. So I think the balance, and it's tougher when you love your job, is the lines are blurred because you can work at 3 a.m. and you're not out of balance because you're doing what you love. And I will make a moral judgment here and say when you love your job, you're a better parent and a better family person that you found satisfaction. And I have worked jobs. Don't, don't think that my linear timeline, Jennifer was exactly right. If you turn that thing into a four dimensional graph and looked at how it, it's very zigzag and you know, sort of follow your nose thing. But in the end, after working on and I had jobs as an electrician, I worked as a mechanic. I had jobs that I didn't like as much, but I knew why I was there temporarily. So I was able to put that into context and believe me, when you have a job you don't like, work-life work, work life balance is not a problem. Um, but when you love your job, the lines are blurred so much that work-life balance takes on a little bit different definition and doesn't have that, that hard um, line between this is my career and this is family time. I think for all of us who travel, we've traveled with our family on work trips and it really becomes blurred. 
So those opportunities are there because you love your job, because you're shaping your job. And I will, I'll plug this once again, creativity, creativity, creativity. All of us who are technical or academic people aren't taught to be creative or to emphasize the creative, but creativity is absolutely key in all of this to opening up your own opportunities. And I'm gonna leave it to the other panelists to give another perspective. I guess I'll, I'll go next. I don't have a family or a significant other and I live in the woods and with my dog and my cat. And this is actually where I live. This is a cabin that was built in 1942. So I, I almost didn't want to chime in here because my life seems so ideal compared to everyone else right now during the pandemic. I live in a place where I can hike every day and my, my schedule's gotten totally turned upside down on its head like everyone's, but I'm in a really beautiful location. So to be isolating here is just, a, I'm just incredibly fortunate. And I would agree with what the other panelists have said. I mean, I like my job so much that I spend all of my free time chasing quail and doing field work with graduate students and postdocs. And that consumes my free time. And that's why I took this job. I was really interested in pursuing long-term studies on a system that I had developed as a 27-year-old. And I'm still working on that system. And it's not something that the National Science Foundation, you know, would continue to support for my entire lifetime. But I'm a, the director of a field station. I live on my field site. And I can go to other field stations and continue collecting data on this one system that I'm so passionate about. So I'm pursuing like fun things for my day job, doing all these management plans and NSF reports and, you know, giving little public lectures and writing for the local newspaper and all that stuff. But my real passion is doing my research and I use my free time to do that. And so I'm like a lot of the panelists where my personal life and professional life are all just kind of jumbled up and that's what I chose. So uh, I'll jump in and say that's, so I'm kind of in the same place Jennifer is now. My, my boys are grown and out of the house. And so, um, but as I said, and you know, I, I don't know if I was too timid. Um, so I finished my degree, I finished my PhD in 1990. And I was able to, one of the mentors that I had in life, af again, after I said, I'm concerned because in having a family, and it isn't that you have to do it, it's that I, also wanted to do things like be a Girl Scout leader and, you know, run the science fair at the elementary school. And those are the kind of things that I was able to do and maybe could have done. I see people doing it now um, that you could still do that and, and people respect that. I took on a part-time postdoc. It was the first time they offered a part-time postdoc. And I did that at a 75% level uh, and did a couple of different ones of those early on that helped. Um, there were some some huge life challenges in that time um, that that made things tricky. I'm glad I chose the path that I did. Um, and I did not know that I would ever be able to come back into the kind of job that I have now and was a little concerned about that. But it did work out. And I, I again, as Stephen said, you kind of pay attention to what's happening. Um, you look for opportunities, people who know you and know your work ethic. I think are also often looking out for you and pointing out um, potential uh, jobs for you. And I, I did when my boys were young and um, I was a single mom, uh, I did the communications job that I mentioned earlier where I was looking at other positions. And that was a little bit more manageable in that time than some of the lab research I had been doing. So I, I think it is a concern. I'm very happy to be where I am now and be like several of the rest of you have said, I just love my job and I hope I break when I'm supposed to and, and go do things. But sometimes I'm just so wrapped up in the work uh, that I maybe put in too much time on it. But um, I, I think you have to be aware of it. And as several people have said, just kind of keep checking yourself. What's important to me? What are my values? Am I following my heart? Um, and I think it, it can work. Thanks. 
So I'm going to pivot us a little bit to a few um, questions that are, I don't know, maybe a little more nitty gritty. Um, and one of them is, if a job description says bachelors with masters preferred and or five years of relevant experience, does a PhD count as relevant experience or is the relevant experience on top of getting the degrees? And then I'm just going to bundle up another question in there too about how one asks about salaries. It says, I get frustrated looking at job listings that don't post salaries, especially in locations with high cost of living. Is it okay and are you likely to, leave, uh, to receive a response if you inquire about salary before applying? So I don't know if, if any of you had to experience, you know, aspects, either of those aspects, but um, yeah. So I, I hire and I get those questions. And I can tell you right now in the context of being curious about the position, it is not off-putting for people to ask about salary. Um, that's a realistic concern. Um, I'm always impressed by people who I work for the University of California. So Scripps is part of that big sort of lumbering 10 campus system. It's pretty easy um, to do a little sleuthing in the background. If you know the position title and classification, you can find a salary range pretty quickly. So unless it's a private firm, you know, if you're going for a private job, then it can be really hard to suss out how much they're paying. Although for most private firms, um, you could almost be sure that the salaries are higher than they are at universities. So, so for the same job, it could be one and a half times higher. But to, the short answer is it's not off-putting um, and it shows initiative. Uh, for that person to be interested in to ask a direct question. I will say if it's the first question, it's interpreted differently than if they ask about the job and then, oh, by the way, um, uh, how easy is it to get uh, um, housing there given the cost of living and the salary level? I'm sorry, did you say the salary le level? And then, you know, then that conversation starts. So there's ways to go about it. Again, with the creativity thing, instead of just going head, head, you know, head first into it, there's ways to be curious and to uh, get the other person to warm up to you, the hiring person. And, uh, and they invite detailed questions like that. Great. I'll Thanks. chime in a bit on the degree stuff, I suppose. Um, so when we hire in our agency, we kind of have these sort of HR set minimum requirements that are along the lines of, of what was asked, you know, this preferred or that with this many years and up. Uh, in my experience, we can use, you know, and this is my agency, we can usually get around that if we can justify that this candidate is the person that is the right fit for this job. Uh, so that's not, you know, a, a direct answer of does a PhD equal four years of, of, you know, is that the same as master's plus four years or whatever. But uh, I can tell you that when we hire in our group, we're looking for the right fit for the position. Uh, and I just would have to justify that higher up in the chain of command to make that happen, but it will be able to, to happen. Uh, we, as far as I know, we always post salaries, so I'm not sure that I can comment on that too much other than saying I would not, I wouldn't think anything of somebody asking me the salary if we weren't allowed to post it on the job posting, personally. Yeah, and I would just add in terms of the minimum requirement, uh, you know, just like Steven said, I call call and ask, um, you know, what is the job and this is my situation. What do you think? That's, that's only going to look good if you decide to apply because you did show the initiative to wonder how this would fit with what you've done. Great. Yeah, I just want to add real quick too. Sometimes I get emails from students that are, I've never met the person, don't know their name and it's like a one-liner so, you know, maybe you're searching for jobs and you see this one that doesn't have a salary. Well, don't just shoot the person an email and say, what's the salary? You know, <laughs> that's very off-putting. Um, but so, yeah, just like Beth and Stephen both said, it's more about the, the approach and the communication aspect of it. Cool. It's not what you ask, it's how you ask it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
That's great. So I'm going to um, let Kristen ask each of you, we'll have each of you respond to a final question. But before she does that, I do want to tell the attendees, there's um, quite a few outstanding questions, some of which are asking for actual resources, like where do you search for jobs or, um, you know, do you have any resources for continuing education and things like that. So those are great questions for us to go ahead and put on the Google Doc and hopefully assemble some answers afterwards. Um, so don't, don't fear, we'll, we'll try to get you answers to all of these questions. But um, there's a fun um, question that, at, about your favorite projects that I'll turn it over to Kristen and uh, each of you will answer this and then I think we'll be um, just about out of time. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, we thought this would be a, a great one to end on. And so everyone, please do look out for that follow up email we'll, where you'll get the link to the document answering all of the additional questions. But so this question for each of you is what is one of your favorite projects that you've worked on and why? Um, and then, you know, related to that, what do you find most rewarding about your work? So either a favorite project or a favorite aspect of your current job? Whoever has the brilliant in <laughs> insight first, go for it. I can start. Um, yeah, so I kind of started off in my intro saying how I wanted to, you know, save the environment. I wanted to do something. Um, and, you know, being in academia and postdoc and everything is all about research, research. And I knew I always wanted to, you know, do something helpful more than publishing information. Um, so when I got to my position, um, we started looking into the water quality of this river system in our backyard of our office, basically, um, that nobody had ever um, looked at. And, you know, there had been fish kills um, there. Um, there's oyster harvesting going on that locals um, really care about. Um, so we started a, a water quality monitoring project and um, it's really gotten to the point of application. So there are things happening, you know, um, the state is now assessing the water body for impairments and we're moving forward with a restoration plan with the community um, to, to make it better. So, and that's really like one of the few times in my career that I can say that I'm like doing something to help the environment. So. Um, and it's a lot about um, doing things that people care about. So everybody in our area loves the Guana River. Um, and so it's really easy to make something like this happen because you can get input from a lot of different people and move it, move it all forward. Come on, I know you, other, you others have some favorite projects. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't think of a standout specific project that I want to talk about right now, but I can talk about what in general uh, I, I like about my job, I guess you could say. So to me, um, you know, I help people do a lot of a data analysis that they don't feel comfortable doing on their own and, and, and they may or may not have their data in a good format. And to me, these kind of almost become puzzles. So it's, I, I just like the projects that really challenge me, whether that's because it takes a lot of create, you know, Stephen mentioned creativity. So it's maybe that the project is a challenge because I have to get really creative in my coding because their data was a mess or I get to get really creative because it's a complicated question that takes a complicated answer and I get to do something uh, semi innovative um, for data analysis wise. So, you know, I can think of a handful of projects where that's happened for me, but really that's what's satisfying about my job is the diversity of projects I get to work on and how they challenge me all the time and they, they get like puzzles that I just can't let go. And my, some of my coworkers take advantage of this. They know that if they drop a seed in my head four hours later, I'll come back with, with some useful information from that for them because I, I just kind of can't let those kind of interesting puzzles go. Well, I'm going to bring shame on the group by admitting that I, uh, I left the ivory tower. I left academia for seven years and did pursue, you know, of something that was more financially worthy or so I thought this is, you know, filed under the category of potential mistakes. And I stayed there for seven years um, as a defense contractor. I was in charge of research computing for a small firm and it was great. There were a lot of 
individual projects that were not so wonderful. So when I came back to Scripps, um, I was hired as the lead field engineer um, for an atmospheric science project that involved ships and airplanes and satellites and everything I nerded out over when I was a little kid. And I thought that's perfect for me. And I, it, we were deployed to Fiji for six months. So that sounds awful, right? Um, but what happened after that couldn't have been more disastrous. Everything fell apart. We had to use duct, you know, duct tape and bailing wire to pull everything back together. We built an early version of the internet out of um, 1200 baud modems. And in the rear view mirror, it's one of my favorite projects. And it informed where I was going to go next, which is just like Paul said, when you're blindsided by some of these challenges and every brain cell has to turn on to do it, and you're given the creative latitude to solve those problems, I can think of few things for people like us that are more, or that are more rewarding. And so I completely stick straight into chaos. Um, other people's data, just like Paul, I, I think it's a fantastic insight to how they get, actually think about science. And to back off and get a view of why it's so rewarding, everyone who's looking at the health of the planet from, you know, ecology to physics to atmospheric chemistry and even looking down at the ionosphere, it's a tiny community. Um, so you're about to take part in something. We're looking after the planet if you want to, you know, sort of pat yourself on the back. And your creativity and unique skills are going to have a unique role to play. So don't back off from it. Like Paul is, you know, pursuing vexing problems and Nikki and, and Beth. Each one of us has this extremely valuable role to play. And it is going, when you find the right thing, it's going to challenge you. And hopefully it'll challenge you every single day. And so my favorite projects um, it has now turned into a career, but it's full of data and chaos and poorly things that are poorly organized, and I love it every day. Well, I'll just say that uh, the fact that I have a hard time coming up with a favorite project, I guess, uh, you know, there are just so many things that I've enjoyed doing, but I agree it's sometimes those that seem the most challenging that... Um, end up being the most rewarding. So when I first started in this kind of editing extension position, um, there was a book that had been underway for a while and had been rearranged several times. It wasn't a book yet. It was a uh, in press or getting put together on um, building a business for an agricultural company. And when I came in and, and we were going to try to work on it again, there were parts of the partners who were pretty much done with it, didn't want to continue, weren't sure, um, you know, what, what they, how they should continue to be involved. It had taken a little long and we ended up pulling it together. It was challenging to figure out how to make it easy to read and yet contain useful information. And I was really pleased uh, with the way it turned out. And so, you know, I keep saying when we talk about something that's getting really frustrating, well, remember that book, you know, we almost gave up on that book and, you know, look, look what a long lasting impact that has had. So I, I guess that's one of the seeing things that have been challenging and solving the problem, you know, is uh, life is just a series of problems to be solved, as someone say. And uh, so it's really satisfying when when that works. Thanks, and I, I think we lost Jennifer to the um, internet of the San Jacinto Mountains, uh, or lack thereof. Um, so Kristen, if you want yeah. to. Yeah, uh, well, I just want to thank all of you so much for being part of our panel. I always learn little juicy bits of wisdom from each of you, and I'm sure all of our viewers out there did as well. And yeah, it was sad we lost Jennifer in the end, but she did warn us that could happen in her remote location. But as we mentioned, we are going to let our panelists respond to any outstanding questions on a Google Doc that we will share in a follow-up email. So please be on the lookout for that. And then we do have one more planned career panel on June 26th that will feature science communicators and um, science outreach folks. So be on the lookout for more information about that on our LTER website and social media. Jen? 
Yeah, thank you so much for um, your time and your wisdom and your great thoughts. I know the students appreciate it. And thank you to the attendees for making time. Um, so many of you, uh, you know, over 150 at the peak to um, ask these great questions. And, you know, I know everybody is on Zoom a lot these days. So I just big thanks all around. And um, it's just a way of, of staying closer to each other. So for me, I, I just can't thank you all enough. Great, so with that, attendees will be closing down the webinar and attendees, you will get a very short questionnaire in the email um, that helps us plan um, and evaluate these kinds of, um, of things we're doing um, on behalf of the LTR um, office. So thanks again, everybody. Okay. Thanks, we wish you all well.